talking about today is uh, quite a large one, as you can see. Um, it's um, approximated at $4 trillion of fraud losses for enterprises uh, globally. Uh, the Association of Certified uh, Fraud Examiners um, predict that businesses uh, around the world are losing uh, approximately 5% of their business revenue to fraud. So 5% of business revenue could equate to uh, the net profit of most organizations. Um, so we are actually within this half an hour trying to solve a really big, rich problem. And what we are going to use as a solution is a combination of a little bit of domain knowledge and the very powerful data analytics server or the analytics platform of, uh, uh, of WSO2. Uh, and we are going to use the different flavors of analytics, that is uh, batch analytics, real-time analytics, uh, predictive analytics, and the interactive analytics, together with domain knowledge, to try and solve this problem. Um, we are going to employ many ways to do this. This is not a very simple problem. It's quite a complex problem. Uh, therefore, we are going to attack each uh, side or each part of this problem uh, in many ways. Uh, we'll talk about generic rules, fraud scoring, machine learning, and Markov models. Um, and I will show you how we um, nicely use the different analytics flavors to um, attack each of these um, areas. All right, so to start off with, um, fraud is a very um, different thing to different in industries. What fraud means in a certain industry would be completely different to what it means in another industry. So it is very important that we capture the domain knowledge of domain experts about what fraud means in their industry. So I have given a very simple example from the payment industry where we can just come up with a few, um, few basic ideas about what fraudsters look like in that industry. So in the payment industry, fraudsters would basically use stolen cards. They would, uh, once they use, uh, get hold of stolen cards, they would buy expensive stuff in large quantities, um, most often they're not very quickly, uh, at odd hours, ship to many places so that they cannot be traced back into one address, um, and provide weird email addresses most of the time. So what we are going to do first is we are going to put in place a real-time analytics system or a real-time detection si mechanism so that we can identify these uh, fraudulent behaviors in real time and alert someone so that some action can be taken uh, about it in real time without letting it go. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna convert these behaviors into complex event processing queries. And I'll, and I'll explain why it's complex event processing queries. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this picture from a, a session before. Uh, this explains um, how complex event processing works. So for example, this is a WSO2 uh, CEP. Uh, and when you look at a CEP, it is able to receive data in different formats from different devices. Um, it then converts that data, multiple streams perhaps, uh, into uh, a format that the uh, engine, the processing engine understands. It can do various kinds of complex processing within that engine. Then once the processing is done, it can convert uh, the output into many other formats and send it to different types of devices that would want to receive it. Now, when we talk about the kind of processing that happens within the engine, uh, it's not just simple, um, uh, simple querying or simple filtering. And it's not just about receiving data in multiple streams, but it's about receiving multiple streams, processing them, uh, trying to look for correlations among those streams, and most often than not, doing all of this within a certain time frame. So I have given an example of the kind of query that you would write in a CEP. Um, so right at the bottom, you would see, um, Notify me, I want to get notified if there is a 10% increase in overall trading activity 
and the average price of commodities uh, has fallen by 2% within the last four hours. So multiple things happening. Um, you have to detect them from multiple streams, and that is limited to a, uh, a time limit. So it's very important to use this kind of powerful uh, pattern detection to transform those domain uh, expertise about fraud um, into real-time detection mechanisms. OK, so let's see how this is done in real, real life. Um, when we are doing, um, when, we are, uh, we're, when we are trying to detect fraud, it's very important, two things are very important. One is we have to have a good idea about what is normal because we're trying to see what's abnormal. We have to know what is normal. So we can use things like, in this case, I'm trying to see abnormal trading quantity, right? So in order to define what is normal trading quantity, I use something very simple. I use averages and standard deviations. The second thing is that definition of normal has to be relevant to the current time, to the time where that person is trading. If you are using some historical average and standard deviation, and there is a, some sort of trend or seasonality happening today, then there's going to be a disconnect between the two, and you're going to get false positives. So for that, we use moving averages, where our definition of normal also moves with the trends and seasonalities that occur in transactions. So what we've done here is we've created, we have just two simple queries. The first one is defining what is normal for the current time. So we have a transaction stream, uh, which uh, gives us all the transaction events. And we have created a time window on that transaction stream, in this case, 60 minutes. And for each item type, we calculate the average and the standard deviation of quantity. And we write that to a table. We update a table. Now, this is real time. So we don't have time to write a disk and go to the disk and retrieve the data uh, when we are doing real time processing. So we are actually, in this case, we are using an in-memory event table because all of the processing happens in memory. So we are writing into an uh, in-memory event table. And then the second query is basically where we do the dis detection. We take each transaction that comes in the transaction stream, and for that particular item, we compare it with our definition of normal. So in this case, I've used average plus three standard deviations, where I'm trying to see whether this quantity that is coming in the transaction is larger than 99th percentile of quantities that we've seen so far. If so, we send an alert to the fraud stream. All right, so that's one example. Here's another example. This is to do with transaction velocity. Now, transaction velocity means um, we are, um, it means the speed at which you would transact in a certain item or in a certain store or particular to a certain person. So, for example, if you would take a retail store, a clothing store, uh, and an expensive jewelry store, the transaction velocities of the two stores will be very different because uh, people would buy clothing far more faster then they would buy expensive jewelry. So in this case, we're trying to see whether there is a large number of transactions happening for this from one card number within a short period of time. If so, we want to get an alert. And how we've done that is we've written a pattern. Um, so we are, we are looking for the first transaction uh, from the transaction stream, called, and we call it E1. And then we look for two or more transactions from the same stream for the same card and we want all of that to happen within five minutes. So if it happens within five minutes, we select some information about each of those transactions, and we send it out into the fraud stream. OK? So similarly, we can transform any or all of those domain-specific knowledge about fraudulent behavior into real-time um, processing queries and get an alert when we see that sort of uh, behavior happening in real time. So now, so what if I buy expensive stuff? I might sometimes want to do that, right? Uh, what if I buy very quickly at odd hours, ship to many places? There could be 
a genuine customer behind any of these transactions, right? If someone wants to buy the most expensive item in your store, you don't want to stop that guy because your uh, fraud detection rules are strict, right? You're going to lose uh, business revenue because of that. So um, the idea here is blocking genuine customers because of very strict fraud detection rules could be counterproductive and costly. And we have to address that. That's where scoring comes into play. Uh, we use this thing called scoring, where we use a combination of rules. Uh, we provide a weight to each rule, and we derive a single number that reflects multiple fraud indicators for one transaction. And we compare that single number with a single threshold and um, provide an alert only if this transaction has done badly against multiple uh, fraud indicators. So if you just bought a diamond ring, we don't want to stop that. We want you to go ahead and we want to take, get a profit out of it. But if you bought 20 diamond rings uh, within 15 minutes at 3 o'clock in the morning and shipped it to various places around the world, you still could be a genuine customer, but we want to take a look at it a little further. So we want to get an alert in that situation. How do we do that? We have to know how to score. So um, Mr. Kumar Sangakara certainly has a more entertaining way of scoring, uh, and we have the slightly less flamboyant way of scoring for fraud detection, uh, which is where we provide um, a weight to each fraud indicator, depending on how um, significant that indicator is, and then we multiply that by how that uh, transaction did against that fraud indicator. We sum it up, get one single uh, number, and we compare that with a threshold, and only alert if that uh, threshold has been surpassed. Right. So this is an age-old saying. Um, the known devil is better than an unknown angel. What we've done so far is basically defining the known devil, the known types of fraud that we've seen or domain experts have seen in their industry. But fraudsters are not stupid. Uh, they keep adapting to uh, patterns and seasonalities, and they, they come up with new ways of doing fraud. So in that sense, we need to be able to capture something happening that has never happened before, but we don't know how to define that. And for that, we turn to machine learning. We utilize machine learning techniques to do things like clustering, which I have done here, where we give it a large data set, and we ask it to learn. What has happened in the past? This is how normal people behave and normal people transact. And the machine learning algorithm would then cluster it into different clusters based on certain features of those transactions. When it gets a transaction that is away from any of those clusters, like I have showed in the picture where the point O does not belong to any of those clusters, it will give us um, an alert. So that is how we... Um, guard ourselves against the unknown angel. So now we have modeled the known types of fraud and the unknown types of fraud. So we're good to go, right? Except what we've looked at so far are point anomalies. And um, each of the alerts that we've got so far belong to one single transaction that has been used to um, achieve some fraudulent means. But if you take a look at organized crime rings, they don't operate so simply. What they do is, in order to um, avoid their transactions getting caught by fraud detection systems, they um, kind of divide their uh, fraudulent means into multiple transactions, small transactions, and they would spread it across. They would either distribute it uh, geographically, or they would use different cards to achieve it. So they would make uh, smaller transactions that look completely normal, but when you take those transactions together as a sequence, they look weird, or they are abnormal, and they are used to achieve some fraudulent means. And we have a solution for that, too. Um, we use Markov models to, um, uh, first, to model randomly changing systems, understand what normal behavior is like for sequence of events, and then to detect rare activity sequences based on probabilities. Um, how we do this is, is it's a three-step process. Um, 
So uh, the three steps are, you first look at the transactions and you classify each transaction into a certain state. So based on certain features of the transaction, for example, its, um, its price or the velocity at which it has been uh, transacting, you would assign a certain state for those transactions. Then you would count how the transactions uh, or the, how the states have transitioned from one state to the other. So what, are the what is the probability of a small valued transaction done at a high speed? What is the probability of that being followed by a large valued transaction done at 3 o'clock in the morning, for example? So we come up with a probability matrix for transactions that we've seen so far. And in real time, when we get a transaction sequence, we assign the states for those transactions as well, and then we compare the state transition of that entire sequence with the probabilities that we have in the probability matrix. That way, we can have a threshold for transaction sequence probabilities, where if uh, a certain sequence happening is very improbable or improbable, we get an alert. So in this example, I just have two states, and I have just, mentioned, I have just calculated the probability of uh, a, a an event with state E being followed by an event, another event with state E is 0.1, whereas E being followed by A is much higher, 0.9. So we can have a large sequence, which is like E, E, A, E, or something like that, and we combine the probabilities and figure out whether this is probable or not. So, uh, in the words of the great Sherlock Holmes, uh, one true inference invariably suggests others. Now, we have detected fraud in many different ways. We have detected the, the known types of fraud, we have detected the unknown types of fraud, and we have also uh, moved beyond point anomalies and we have de detected uh, fraudulent sequences. However, once we are alerted about a fraud, we don't want to stop there. We don't want to stop with just blocking that transaction. We want to use that event and the information in that event to understand what this guy has been up to uh, before this. Try and see whether we can unearth some other connections of people related to him who has done other fraudulent means. Or even uh, try to look for other transactions that have gone under the radar. So for that, now so far, we used um, batch analytics, real-time analytics and predictive analytics to detect the fraud. Once we detect the fraud, we use interactive analytics, the fourth flavor, to understand connections uh, and isolate incidents around it. So um, we use the interactive analytics to provide historical data so that a fraud analyst can dig deeper. We make querying and filtering very easy so that he's easily able to um, bring up other data items that are relevant to this um, event, and we provide useful visualizations so that you can unearth connections and uh, isolate incidents. So all this sounds good. Um, and if you're a bit curious as to how we achieved all of this uh, in using one platform, I would just like to show you a small video. The fraud detection toolbox has been built using the WSO2 data analytics server. It's set up so that the data comes in through an event receiver, flows through an execution plan that cleans up the data, and the resultant stream is sent to a series of fraud detection rules. These include the generic rules, fraud scoring, Markov modeling, and clustering. When any of these rules are violated, it will output a fraud alert into the fraud stream and a final query will combine all alerts pertaining to a single transaction and send out one alert containing all the information about why that transaction was deemed fraudulent. In this case, the event is sent out of a WebSocket so that it communicates to a dashboard. You can easily change the setup to receive and send data in many other formats. We have multiple receivers and publishers that can transmit data in formats such as HTTP, JMS, SOAP, 
SMS, email and many more. This way you can choose to send the fraud alert to an existing dashboard or you can use the fraud detection dashboard which we have created. When a fraud is detected, an alert will appear on the screen. This provides all the information regarding the transaction sent from the real-time analytics engine of the data analytics server. It shows which fraud rules have been violated as well as all other information contained in the incoming transaction. When we press investigate, it automatically queries the last five transactions that were done using the same card number. You can query transactions based on a default date range or a custom date range. And if you want to be really specific, you can provide a time duration too. You can pick which columns you want to see and if you want to query any specific transactions, for example based on card number or originating IP address, you can define those filters and query specific transactions too. All this is made available using the interactive analytics capabilities of the data analytics server. Let's go through a real example. If we look at the transactions that have been queried by default, it seems like this is a guy who resides in USA. But there is one transaction which has originated from a different continent. Since we want to analyze this IP address a bit further, let's click on that IP address. Now it shows other transactions originated from this IP address. Looks like he has been shipping to all over the world. If we want to check on the other cards that he has used from this IP address, we query other transactions where this card has been used. And now we see another IP address that is using the same card and shipping to the same address. So we can query more transactions from that IP address and so on. At this point in time, we can find some very specific patterns that correspond to international fraud rings where the same card number is used from multiple locations in the world to ship to a known set of addresses. We can provide many such visualizations based on transaction size, transaction sequence and as many as you like. The WSO2 Fraud Detection Solution provides aggressive fraud detection using the batch, real-time and predictive analytics and further investigation capabilities using the interactive analytics functions of the WSO2 Data Analytics Server. Thanks. So, um, if you're further curious, uh, we have a bunch of resources uh, in our website. Uh, if you go to the analytics micro uh, site uh, and find your way to uh, the solutions, uh, you will find the fraud detection solution and a whole bunch of resources around it. Uh, we also have a white paper which explains in detail how each of these algorithms work and how we've used the technologies to make it work. So now that you have seen uh, how the different flavors can be used to first detect fraud and then to investigate further, I would just like to, uh, put, to uh, put this in perspective and show this, how, how this fits in to different industries. Now, um, the example we were covering in this session was uh, in the payment industry. So in the payment industry, what we would do is we would just plug in the fraud detection toolkit, which is built from the Antics platform, uh, into a payment system where the transactions of the payment system would be published to the data analytics server, and the data analytics server takes care of the rest. Uh, it will do the necessary processing, and it will alert uh, based on uh, the queries getting triggered and this alert could be sent out uh, either to a dashboard or to some other uh, to, to as an email or to a, as an SMS or to any way that you want to receive it. Um, if you look at the banking industry this uh, can be reused and is reused uh, to detect anti-money laundering. 
So what would happen is you would plug this into your core banking system. Your core banking system will publish banking transactions to the data analytics server, and the rules would be configured in a way that uh, it's capable of identifying anti-money laundering uh, scenarios, and that would be alerted. Um, we also did a POC for identity fraud by connecting this with the WSO2 identity server. So you can actually plug this into your identity provider where the identity provider would publish identity events such as logins, logouts, uh, password changes, the frequencies of that happening, etc., to the data antic server. And the uh, antic server will be configured to identify identity theft related incidents. And that would be alerted as well. Now, in most of these uh, scenarios, you saw that the alerts are going out. It's either going to a dashboard or it can go to uh, a person, an email, or anything like that. But in certain cases where you're completely sure this is fraudulent and you don't need any analyst or any human um, interaction before you take any action, if you want to block it then and there, you can also feed back. Uh, that alert into the system. So you can feed back the alert into your payment system or into your identity provider so that you can take some action in real time when that is captured. So you can either block that transaction or send out a warning from the system to the user um, and, and, and take the necessary action without waiting for human intervention. <laughs>